Welcome to the Yours in Marketing podcast. Hey, it's Blake here. If this is the first time that you're joining us on the Yours in Marketing podcast, do me a favor. Please go wherever you get your podcast, doesn't matter where, and please review, rate, subscribe to the podcast right now. Well, or after the episode, whichever works for you. We're really looking for your support so that we can build this and make it even more valuable for you. So please rate, review, and subscribe the Yours in Marketing podcast. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. On today's episode, I speak with Kevin Indig, who is the VP of SEO and content at G2 Crowd. He was fascinating to talk to. He's originally from Germany, speaks perfect English though, and he's just the coolest guy. He's done so much good work with G2, and I was really excited to speak with him. So just to give you a taste of what we talk about and what you're going to learn in this podcast. First off, we talk about what SEO is going to look like in 10 years. Also, we talk about his lofty goals for growth at G2 Crowd. And finally, you're going to learn how to create and act upon new career opportunities. So you're going to want to stick around. This is a unique one. I highly recommend it. So here is the interview with Kevin Indig. Okay, so today with me, we have Kevin Indig. Kevin, how are you doing? Doing fantastic. How are you? I am doing great. And so, Kevin, you're in Palo Alto right now. Is that right? That is right. But that is not where you're originally from. You're from <laughs> Germany. So let's. that's a good place to start. Um, I My ancestors are German. So there's that. <laughs> I am originally from America. But I, I want to talk about your, your origin story. I want to find out kind of where you came from, what kind of kid you were, what kind of person you were. Mostly, I, I want to focus on the professional side of it, obviously, and see how you got into SEO as well. Sounds good to me. Thank you, man. Yeah. So let's go for it. What is your origin story? Tell me all about who you were, who you are now, and where you're going. <laughs> all right. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> you have you have three sentences. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, it's okay. You can go a little bit longer than that. <laughs> great, great. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll try to keep it distinct, but there is a long journey there. So it all started in Western Germany 31 years ago, and I grew up in a small rural town, which is the oldest city in Germany. In fact, it's over 2,000 years old. No Looks way. a bit like a Roman museums, tons of old Roman buildings there, which is awesome now going back. But when you grew up there, it's <laughs> like, uh, you know, pretty boring. <laughs> but uh, anyway, grew up yeah in this rural town. Um, had a very early knack for technical stuff. I was early on blown away by the internet when broadband internet came out around the 2000s. So that's when I was about 13, 14 years old, and I got heavily into gaming, online gaming, of course, uh, games like StarCraft, Diablo, and uh, Warcraft, um, Counter-Strike. Uh, spent a lot of time in front of the computer, but also kind of, you know, developed a an understanding for hardware, attuned my computer and all that stuff. Sure. So I think that's where a lot of the the foundation for my venture into technical marketing came from. Um, I then went on to uh, go to college um, close to Cologne, studied business, which in hindsight, you know, I, I should have probably studied some like computer science uh, or so, but back then I wasn't. I was going to say, uh, like, did you ever think that you were just going to be in, in coding? Did you thought, think you were going to be a computer science major or? Honestly, no. I always thought I was going to go into medicine until I was about 18 years old. So my father is a doctor wow. and ah. I feel like medicine, especially doctors, they have such a strong pull on their children. It, it really kind of, I'm sure everybody <laughs> you know, whose yeah. his parents are in, in, uh, in medical can relate, but um, it is a very, very inspiring profession. But then when I was about 18, I realized that the downsides of that profession had really turned a bit sour for me. And so I thought that business was probably the best way to go. And in hindsight, you know, nowadays I understand that I'm deep in tech and I, I feel like, so my personal mission is that I, I really think tech can help a lot of people in the world, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to be naive and say that tech is automatically good. I'm just saying it's a way to scale the help that doctors can provide to a smaller amount of people, right? So I still think that this kind of core mission kind of stuck with me, but 
the way to get there changed. And so sure. back then, you know, I thought business was the right way to go. I don't really regret it, right? I just think that I could have made a smarter choice. Anyway, <laughs> did that, went to southern Switzerland to work for a private bank because I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> I, was, I was not stuck in like, you know, like a bit of a conservative view on what a career is you know like sure prestigious all that kind of stuff and and it was right i it made good money uh for a junior um it was suit and tie every day but then after about a year i realized man this whole technical and that stuff a bank is probably the worst place to to learn that and to dive into that uh, yeah. so uh, <laughs> yeah that was i mean it was it was a cool time it was just yeah not the best choice then anyway what city in switzerland there was Lugano, which is the Italian part in the very south of Switzerland, which is beautiful. It's, it's it. like 15 minutes away from the Italian border. And it's a cool combination of the Italian lifestyle and the Swiss lifestyle. So, you know, like now, as, as I'm in my, my early 30s, I think it's it's an awesome place. But back then, sure. it was my early 20s. And there was no club and no party, no nothing. <laughs> it's like, I got to get the hell out of here. It's funny how that changes. Well, the only reason I ask is because I actually lived in Switzerland for six months. No way. Where did you live? Well, I, technically, I was right on the border of Switzerland and France, so I was kind of in Geneva, but on a, in a city called Annemasse in France. But uh, I know all too well the border of Italy and Switzerland and France and all that, so I was, that's very interesting to me personally. What brought you there? <laughs> uh, I actually was doing volunteer missionary service, so... Very cool. It was, yeah, it was, it was a really cool experience. I was, mostly, I was actually on the other side in, in like Bordeaux and Lyon in France, but never, never got into Germany. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a really interesting piece of the world. Switzerland has a really high living standard, as you know. Uh, oh, yeah. it's, uh, it combines lots of cultures, so it's a it's a really interesting place. Yeah, it costs like thirty dollars to get a box of cereal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I, I kind of stuck to that because now San Francisco is just as expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, sorry I interrupt you there. Anyway, so you're you're at this bank, and then you decide. It's really maybe not the best place if you're going to want to be in tech. So then where do you go from there? From there, I decided to go back to Germany, um, but to the north, to Hamburg. And in Hamburg, I was lucky to find an agency that would take me up for a traineeship. It was kind of an agency, but much more a consultancy. And I got really lucky to to, to get into that program. It was a nine-month traineeship that taught me everything from the ground up from really technical experts, very SEO focused, but the consultancy offered a broader online marketing array of services. And they had clients like airlines, TV networks, insurances, banks, big consumer goods, those kind of brands. So it was a great exposure to, you know, really big companies and, you know, very technical. Uh, and I learned so much there. And I was there for about two years. And then the, the consultancy, unfortunately, went downhill a bit. They went bankrupt in the end because sure. they, they just took on too much too, too early. They wanted to provide so many different services and they really scaled up too quick. I think that that's what it came down to. Are there are there any key lessons? in This is all before you actually came over to America, obviously. So in that time in Germany and Switzerland, back in Germany, are there any key lessons or principles that you learned that kind of stick with you today? So yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, I only came to the S about a bit more than five years ago. Key lessons that I learned, I think very early on, I was forced to kind of create my own knowledge or learn from my own experience, better said. So one of the first things that they that they made us do in the traineeship was to create our own online project. It could be a blog or like a little store or whatever, but you had to set something up. And this was, I, I think this was very smart and I still kind of pass that on as advice nowadays. You have to be a practitioner. And mo that's kind of true for every profession, but it is m way more true for SEO and online marketing as a whole. You have to have your own experience. It's not enough to read the books. You have to read the books, but you cannot only rely on that, right? Yep. And so, yeah, that, that was great. And then just uh, understanding the dynamics of what a big enterprise looks like in terms of, the priorities for SEO. So, you know, when you're in SEO or, or in content marketing, you often think that this is the most important thing in the world and how can a company not invest millions of dollars into that? But when you're actually exposed to the senior leadership of a behemoth of a company, then you realize that this is actually just like a, almost like a rounding error. And sometimes it's very relatable. Sometimes it's not, right? But sometimes you can also, 
you get a reality check for your perspective. And this is another thing that I that I was lucky to learn pretty early on in my career. Let's talk about your your transition then to the United States. So that was back in 2014, right? So what what prompted you to decide I'm going to pack everything up. I'm going to go over to Silicon Valley, the most expensive place in America, and I'm going to make a career there. That is a great question. So I actually have to take a step back there. I was born with an American citizenship. A lot of people always ask me, hey, how did you get to Silicon Valley? It's so hard (laughs) to get a visa and stuff. And I just won the lottery, literally. Not not as as in the sense of winning a green card, but as in picking the right parents. My father is American, (laughs) actually. So (laughs) uh, that's, you know, what first of all gave me the opportunity to come over. And then second, um, I had family since I was born that lived in Los Angeles, aunt and uncle. And so I grew up visiting them regularly and kind of learning this or getting an idea of this Californian lifestyle, which is awesome as a kid, especially, right? It's always sunny, it's beaches, Disneyland, sugar everywhere, that kind of stuff. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, And that kind of stuck with me. I always wanted to come over to California and at least live here for a while. So in 2014, I got the opportunity by Search Metrics, an enterprise SEO platform, which is from Germany. And the founder and CEO, Marcus Tober, well, I, I knew him back from Germany. And uh, we had a conversation about me coming over when I saw that they had a an open position here in the Bay Area. And um, yeah, one thing led to the next. Uh, and uh, eventually I was sent over. Have you noticed any humongous differences between how, whether it's in business or just personally, how things are done in Germany versus the United States? Oh, yeah. I'm going to write a book about that someday. <laughs> there's there's major differences. To distill it down to a couple of points, I think, so as of my, this is my understanding, right? I'm not saying this is universally true, but there is an inherent different view on the world when you compare uh, Germans and Americans. So the Americans are often very optimistic. There's a, a very strong can-do attitude. And in Germany, I'm not saying they're pessimistic, but Germans will find 10 reasons for why something will not work, whereas a lot of Americans will find 10 reasons for why it works and ignore the rest, right? And sure. it, nothing is better, right? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It's not, it's not like this one view is so much better than the other. Both come with advantages and, and disadvantages. But it is a difference that I think makes people take more risks here in the U.S. and especially in the Bay Area, especially in California or Northern California. Yeah, just I, I think that's interesting. It sounds like in, in on average... In Germany, it's a little maybe a little more analytical and realistic, whereas in America, it's more positive and maybe you can even say a little ignorant, but in a in a positive way at times too, because sometimes you need to be a little ignorant to take those risks. But it's it's really interesting how there's like the the analytical side of it, and then more of like maybe a creative or positive aspect. But like you said, neither one is inherently better. It's just, that's just how it is. That is absolutely true. I I 100% agree with you here. And so, yeah, I mean, it it takes probably a bit of obsession and maybe Tay to go out and start a startup and think, hey, you know, like every person in the world should be connected. So I'm going to start Facebook or I strongly believe that you don't have to own a car, so I said Uber or stuff like that, right? I mean, those are moonshots, and that is something that the Germans struggle with a bit more. But the, on the other end, um, you know, Germans are very analytical, very precise, and very good. They're, they're just engineers, you know. They're they're very good yep. at that kind of stuff, and they're very deliberate. Let's rewind a little bit and then blend this in with your experience in America. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your first exposure to SEO particularly, and just what your first thoughts were. Because to give you an example, when I got back from being in Europe, I had no life skills whatsoever. (laughs) And I just needed to like find some kind of job to support myself through college. And I just because I spoke French, I so happened to find a company that had French clients for SEO. So they hired me on, but I had no experience. And for like the first six months, I had no clue what SEO was. So I would love to hear what your first exposure to SEO was and kind of your experience and in, in growing in that field. Sure. My first touch point with SEO was when I built a website for 
a kind of a gaming clan or a group back in Germany. And so there was a group of friends that I played online games with and eventually wanted to play tournaments. So I turned out to be the guy to figure out how to build a website, taught myself basic HTML, CSS, and Photoshop, and built a really crappy website. And uh, <laughs> so after a while, I asked myself, hey, where are actually all these people coming from that are coming to my site? And then I discovered that there's something like Google Analytics. I discovered there's something like organic traffic and SEO. Uh, and it was super basic back then it was you know lots of spammy tactics would still work backlinks yep. were by far the biggest ranking signal it was relatively basic and the cool thing is that you know it was, it was such a black heady hacky type of community <laughs> I, I so well remember that it's a, <laughs> seos were really those kind of magicians but also had a relatively negative reputation but still businesses that wanted to bank on some quote unquote shady tactics would hire SEOs. And that was a great advantage to me because the community and scene was still relatively small back then. And so it allowed me to build some stronger ties with different people in the space, learn quickly and also, you know, find work relatively well. So the it was it was way different then. And then over time, you know, I, I kind of paid my dues in the agency or consulting world. I was half my career, at least so far, was on the agency side. And then halfway through I switched to the in-house side. And so I learned so much on both sides that really helped me to, to refine my skills and develop myself. Did you have a favorite black hat technique that you used to use? <laughs> there is one that I didn't personally come up with, but that that I found super, just super smart. And lots of times it's just being, being creative with things, right? So there's this German retailer called Idealo, I-D-E-A-L-O, and they always had some really, really smart SEOs. And so they used this trick back then. I don't think this is an, I don't think they do this anymore. But it was a a tactic with paginations. So it gets a bit technical uh, tactical here. But basically, you know, when you have uh, lots of paginations like page one, page two, page three, to uh, make it easier to browse a sortiment or an inventory of uh, products, what they would do is that they would no index every page higher than page five. But for the first five pages, their meta titles would be synonyms of the main keyword. And that allowed them to rank for all these synonyms. That was working back then. I don't think it works nowadays anymore. But it allowed them to, to rank for, for thousands of synonyms and rake in tons of organic traffic. It was really, it was not really black hatty or not against any Google guidelines. It was just a creative way to work around a problem. And that was really inspiring to me. Were, th- were there any specific Google updates that hit your websites really hard? Like did the Panda update, for example, did that hurt any of the websites that you've ever built or any of the clients that you've ever worked with? Yes, I had a couple of clients that were hit by Penguin and Panda updates, and then some of them had manual penalties. In In some cases, that was really kind of the reason for why they hired us in the first place. And um I mean, there are so many different stories and each iteration of these updates was a bit different. Just recently, one of my own projects got hit by a um, algorithm update. I think it was one of the Phantom updates, but it's now recovering. And the whole update game is something that I would, I have always been bullish about in my career, but that has changed so tremendously. So there was this whole, I mean, you know, some people that are relatively new to this will not remember, but there was a time when you were actually able to exactly pinpoint what an update did to your site and then change that and then see an immediate risk or a relatively quick response. Not with the Penguin updates, those took forever, but especially with Panda. Um, nowadays, that's not the case anymore, right? A lot of these iterations are being rolled out very slowly over time. You're not 100% sure what really did the trick. And it's really hard to, to counteract some of these things. And I think, I strongly think that Google does this intentionally. So keeping with SEO, now that you are, you're in Silicon Valley, I want to talk about kind of the different approaches that you've seen for startups versus established businesses what, what do you see as the key difference for how SEO should be tackled for each of those? Yeah, so startups have the opportunity to integrate SEO into their DNA from scratch. And to be fair, you know, if you're an enterprise B2B startup, it's probably not super applicable. You can do some stuff with SEO. It's not completely relevant, but it is not as relevant as for, for example, marketplace startups or uh, apps or social networks. But I think one of the biggest 
difference is, is that you have the chance to make SEO a priority early on, which is, after my mind, the biggest blocker or issue that most businesses have is that they, like SEO just doesn't have the power in the business to be implemented. You know, that's what I always refer back to. It's not, in most cases, it's not knowing what to do, it's getting it done. And so startups usually have some sort of a scalable or a way to scale pages efficiently. Sometimes it's because user there they have user generated content. Sometimes it's some sort of a scalable page format. Think of like an inventory like Airbnb, for example. And so this is one of the the biggest differences I would say is using SEO to scale a page format very early on and drive tons of organic traffic with them. Is there a startup out there right now that particularly impresses you with how they're using SEO? That is a great question. Um, there is a startup from Germany that's called Home to Go, and another one called Nest Pick, and they're both somewhat competitors to Airbnb, and they both do a brilliant job in creating awesome uh, landing page formats. So um, Home to Go, I think, is a dark competitor to Airbnb. Nest Pick is more like a meta search. Yeah, they just really embrace the whole idea of creating only outstanding pages and not kind of bloating the index, the Google index with subpar or thin content, really thinking about user intent heavily and providing an awesome experience. I mean, the things like, I think Mike King, uh, who's an outstanding SEO, said it best when he said that SEO is actually really a layer to put on top of other things. It's not his own real thing. It's just a kind of best practice to to do front-end development uh, and, and back-end development, design, content creation, all these kind of things. So I think people... Like to me, this was a real realization. I think where people should keep that in mind. Well, you're also heavily in content marketing, so let's do the same question for there. Is is there anybody right now that's just crushing the content marketing game that just stands apart from the others? Yeah, um, that's G two. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> that's us. <laughs> no, I think hey, that's uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, that, that was a joke. I think uh, HubSpot does a great job. I think sure. they're they're kind of a, a big example for content marketing. Maybe even one of the inventors of the term. And so it's it's interesting how content and content marketing has become its its own thing. So content used to be so first in the beginning of SEO or in the early days or in the, in the early days of the of the web as we know it today as content was not really so important, right? And then it became this thing that helped you rank better and now it's actually a real moat for business. If you create outstanding content as a business, that's something that nobody can take away from you. And it's not just this thing that helps you get organic traffic, but it's also something that that drives direct um, traffic and helps you to become a destination. So uh, I'm not only talking about publishers, I'm talking about any type of business. So it's really interesting how that has gained importance over time. I think it's, it's interesting what you said about SEO is kind of like a layer on top of everything else. Content marketing, obviously, is it's kind of its own thing where if you have this strategy in place and you're producing really quality content over time, then adding that SEO layer is another thing that helps you differentiate because that, they're kind of two separate things. But when you really get down to it, content marketing isn't actually really effective without the help of SEO in the first place. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I'm going to come back to some really cool content uh, or startups that I think leverage content really well. Um, I want to throw Canva into the mix and Typeform. And there, there are obviously so many others that are doing an amazing job, but these come to mind. NerdWallet does amazing content marketing yep. just to you know, to revert back from this uh, poor joke that I made earlier on. <laughs> but yes, it's it, it, definitely SEO is a thing you can you want to lay on top of content and then create an awesome experience and you get the best of both worlds, right? You get the organic traffic and you get stuff like, you know, brand positioning, becoming a destination, returning visitors, all these kind of goodies. I want to give you a chance to sound like a total genius right here. (laughs) So imagine right now, somebody's listening to this podcast 10 years in the future, Uh, whoever it is, I don't know, John SEO is listening to the podcast 10 years from now. And right now I, I ask you, what is the what's your main prediction for what SEO is going to look like in ten years? What would you say? Wow, that's a <laughs> that's a high bar to sound like a genius because I can also sound really <laughs> stupid. No, totally can, yeah, it's possible. We'll no, see no. in ten years. We'll come back to it. We'll we'll interview you ten years from from today, and we'll see how you do. I'll take you up on that, <laughs> and I'll also take the risk. So I think ten years from now, obviously, it's super hard to predict the future. But I think my hunch is that 
will be far away from any textual content and SEO will have trans first of all, rich media like audio and video has become so much more important. And maybe there's another content format that we're not seeing right now, something like a, a virtual reality type of, I don't know what, something, right? Maybe you'll have a search engine for virtual experiences that teach you something like Neo and the Matrix. I don't know. That's just, you know. I like it. That's just a guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would love that too. And then I also <laughs> think that Google is not going to be in the same position that it is nowadays. I would... It's really hard because we're at such an inflection point right now. But I would guess, I would assume that there are way more players out there. Yeah. And um, the reason for that is multifold. So first, it, we see strong signs right now that Google is turning away from being a search engine and much more an answer engine. And I wrote an article about that on my blog. Uh, and I think we're seeing more and more signals of that. Number two, I would say that other search engines will kind of fill the void there. Uh, jump into the gap. And then number three, with every new wave of technology, search is often disrupted. So from desktop and the internet to smartphones, Google did a really good job at, at staying relevant, but the likelihood of them keeping that up is, I think, relatively low. And that's just simply because of the disruptive nature of new technology. You know, you, you usually find new startups storm the front and take the realm when a new wave of technology hits. And so we're now at kind of in this post-smartphone era. And I think that there are a couple of candidates to be like the next big thing. And whatever the next big thing is, I think it will probably be different companies that will be the best at that than the ones that we're seeing nowadays. That could I could totally be wrong on that, but that's if, if I had to make a prediction to the next 10 years, that's what I'd say. I actually agree with a lot of that. First and foremost, we've already seen that podcast snippets are in Google now, like in the search results, you can see actual audio recordings in the, as featured snippets. So that's already happening. Podcasting's only getting bigger. Video's only getting bigger. So I agree with that. But then from a competition standpoint, you've already got people like DuckDuckGo that a lot of people have abandoned Google for because of the anonymity and the privacy that you get with DuckDuckGo. So there are going to be all these other search engines with value propositions around them that maybe can convince you know, maybe 1% of Google's users to leave here and there. And over time, it'll chip away. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, it's such a cognitive bias to think that all the incumbents right nowadays are so strong, they're never going to be pushed off the throne. That's what people thought when Google came up, right? Everybody was like, yeah, sure, Alta Vista and Yahoo, like, why should anybody replace that? And <laughs> <laughs> it goes really, really fast uh, sure once does. you get there. So I don't think anybody's safe in this game. And the network effects that make a company big nowadays can also tear it to shreds really quickly. Yeah, well, you, you talked about it earlier. You remember the broadband days. And uh, I mean, I remember that too a little bit. And now we have, we almost have 5G widespread. Yeah. So yeah. it's crazy how things change so quickly to, to think that Facebook, Google, all of these companies are going to be the leaders in 10 years. Maybe a couple of them will be, but the chances are that something else is going to arise. Oh yeah, totally, totally. It's a, it's it's the the inventor's dilemma that Clayton Christensen outlined, right? It's what gets you up to the top is definitely what what keeps you there, and you basically have to disrupt yourself, which is nearly impossible. I mean, if you think back at how Facebook made themselves a a uh, mobile first company, that was an aggressive move. You were not allowed to put to pitch any internal projects without showing how this would work on mobile first. So it's a tough job. And uh, again, the likelihood of a tech company staying at the top for as long as we've seen these old classic incumbents staying at the top is relatively low. We'll move on from that segment. We will revisit this. I promise. 10 years from now, somebody's going to hold us accountable for, <laughs> for these predictions. Love it. <laughs> but I, I want to move on and talk about G2 for a minute because you were at Atlassian. Now you're at G2 Crowd. You're the VP of SEO and content. Obviously, G2 is one of the leading software directories on the planet. So obviously, it makes sense why you would want to go there. But I'd love to hear kind of what that transition was like, why you decided to go to G2, what different opportunities it presented you, and also maybe some of the difficulties that you've faced so far by working at that that kind of a company. Oh, totally. So one of the major drivers, so there are actually three major drivers for my decision to go to G2. Number one is it's an outstanding group of smart people and hardworking people. So really love that environment that allows me to thrive. 
Number two is the position, obviously itself. So it's it's much higher up the ranks, but that also allows me to just have more, much more influence on things uh, and be more responsible for success and, of course, failure. And the th- number three, and one of the biggest reasons is the opportunity behind G2. So it is a review platform, but we're turning it into a marketplace for B2B software that allows you to not only discover software, but also buy software and then manage software. And that's major. So I think that G2 can become the true aggregator in the space and be kind of the Amazon for software, if you will. And of course, that comes with lots of challenges. I think one of the biggest challenges is that it just makes you compete with so many more companies. So it's not just the other review platforms, but it's also the publishers like a CNET or PC Mag, and it's also the the vendors themselves that we're in some ways competing with, right? And so we're trying to find the right balance of not kind of biting the hand that feeds us, if you will. But at the same time, it is stunning to me that. There is no objective marketplace for software. It is stunning that people go straight to the vendor instead of, you know, like having having this objective platform. But we're also we're, we're going to become more than just a than just a kind of um, marketplace. We're also going to be a solution for you to manage your software, understand where you're spending money, what applications your employees are using, and what else you should put up on your stack. And so there's there's tons of opportunity and there's tons of challenges, of course. A lot of B two B leaders have probably heard of these these directories, these listings like of softwares, but they don't necessarily know what the main difference is because you've got G two, you've got Captera, you've got Software Advice, uh, Git App. What would you say is the difference between these platforms and why G two is is not like them? Is completely different. That is a great question. So first of all. A lot of the sites that you mentioned are editorially driven. So there's an there's a writer who puts together their comp- uh, his or her compilation of the best tools out there. We're not like that. We are a, a marketplace that is built up on reviews. And these reviews are objective. And we put a lot of emphasis and effort into making sure that we're not, there's no bias in our reviews. You're, the ranking on our grid is solely coming from the amount of reviews and how good they are. That's how you kind of get to the top on G2, uh, just to put it out there. We're not influencing these kind of rankings in any way. And uh, again, the, the second thing is that you're able to see exactly how much money you spend on different... So, okay, so this is the buyer side, right? Like, let's say uh, you, you bought a software over our marketplace and then able to use a product that we that we have that's called G2 Track, which allows you to kind of plug in to your accounting software. And then you see all the money you spent on different apps. You see the usage of those apps and you see if a similar company to yours has a different stack, right? So you get recommendations to acquire other apps as well. And then we have a product that's called Buyer Intent where you can see if you have a profile on G2, who visits your profile and what company they're from. And so we can give you a good estimation of how willing a different company is to buy from you, which is super powerful. So it goes beyond just, you know, seeing how well your software is reviewed, but it also helps you to understand the opportunities of behind prospects and how well you manage your apps. And then on the buyer side, you can compare pricing, you can compare reviews, and we have by far the most reviews in the space. So I think that's what, what makes it a good experience is um, that you get a you get probably the best reflection out there of how good a solution actually is and how well it fits to your needs. Are there any examples of types of businesses or types of industries that you would actually re- recommend that avoid these directories that avoid G2 that avoid Captera or can like everybody make it work for them or they're just certain that you would say no you this is, should not be a focus for you that's a great question I cannot think of an example where a company should not use that marketplace but I also don't want to put that I'm sure there is some some kind of case for that but I I'm not sure. I don't you know. You about haven't that. come across it yet. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, I'm sure there's something out there. I don't want to be I don't want to sound naive and say, oh yeah, of course everybody should use our platform. Sure. But I compare it very much to how it helps you to be on Amazon uh in terms of visibility and sales. And that's that's kind of how I re- how I view our platform as well. All right. I have I have a question for you that is I had not planned on asking this, but I think you'd have some insight on this. If I gave you the big four companies right now. And asked you to tell me 
which one's most likely to be gone in 20 years, let's say, out of Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon, who would you say is most likely to be dead? I love that question. And I think it's Facebook. I think Facebook is not... They are in a strong position right now, but the lifeline of Facebook is user sentiment. We saw this in the last two years where the reputation of Facebook really suffered due to, you know... <laughs> to say the least, yeah. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> and not only what they did to their stock price, but also to their usage. Now, don't get me wrong. The business as a whole is growing like crazy and is still putting up awesome numbers. But I think that's because people, a lot of people don't have the awareness that WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook are actually the same company. They think that, hey, I'm not on, on Facebook, uh, but they use Instagram, right? They, they're just not aware that this is actually the same thing. Yep. Uh, but I think if the sentiment would turn quickly, then all of their modes would rapidly be gone, right? And that's what I mentioned before. The network effects that got you up there can also destroy you really quickly. I think Apple is in a much better position because, uh, first of all, they don't have to deal with the whole kind of privacy challenges. Second, their brand is still really strong. And third, they can they have a very, very different approach to optimization, Google, I think, well, we'll see. I think it will really depend on how well they will be able to diversify their income streams. They still very much depend on ads. And I see ads as a model that's kind of dying out right now. It's not just for publishers, but people in general are just annoyed of ads. The blindness is as strong as it ever was. And I think that it's not the the most sustainable business model, but they also invested lots of money into, you know, all these other moonshot projects and trying to figure out the, figure out other things. And then Amazon is just, um, I don't think it's, it's stoppable uh, right now. They do an awesome job in preparing themselves for the next five to 10 years. Uh, and if, as Jeff Bezos said, everything you see right now was planned three years ago. Right. So yeah. I think they do an awesome job in this whole kind of disruption innovation cycle. I knew I was going to get a good answer out of you for that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you'd say, looking at it, of those four, that Amazon would have the best chance of being alive in 20 years. Yes, I, my ranking would be Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook. I, I think I agree with that. Facebook, uh, it's not looking great <laughs> in a long term, <laughs> from a long term play, at least. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, at the same time, I don't want to be the fool who underestimates Mark Zuckerberg. There's an awesome book that I read that's called Viral Loop, in which the author kind of explains the situation when Facebook introduced the newsfeed. And so back then, there was this huge outrage. People hated it, and, and you know there was this whole kind of protest. But Zuckerberg stuck to it because he saw in his data that people actually used the newsfeed a lot. So... I think he's an insanely smart guy. I think he's in a great position to figure things out. It's just that from from our from the the facts that I have right now, that's where I think they're in the in the worst position. But again, I don't want to underestimate Mark Zuckerberg here. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna call Zuck after this and tell him that you what you said. Yeah, call him please. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you some rapid fire questions so you can answer them as quickly as you possibly can. And then uh, I'll give you a chance to talk a little bit more about G2 at the end. But this is the rapid fire round. Are you ready, Kevin? I am. Okay. As fast as you can possibly answer in the shortest amount of words. When you think of the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind? Jeff Bezos. Why? Uh, The amount of money, but also the insane reputation that he built for himself. What's something that you believe that other people might think is crazy? Caught me on this one. I believe that we need a better system for voting. I think we need to we need a better system to vet who's in a position to not vote in general, but vote for certain things. There needs to be some sort of a pre qualifier. But that is a that could get me into a lot of trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> Conversation so, for another time, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot more to be said about for that. For sure. What's a common misconception about you? That I only am focused on technical SEO. Well, what what would be the reality to that then? That I'm taking that I'm doing a lot more uh, in terms of analytics, content marketing, content in general, uh, online marketing. So my role has really broadened up over time, 
and I'm running for different teams right now at G2. We can talk about that in a second, if you will. But I have this strong technical SEO background, and there were there were lots of things that I had to say in those realms. But there's so much more that I want to say moving forward about marketing in general. What's uh, do you have like a deepest regret in your life, or or something that you wish that you did better? Smoking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I I quit smoking. I think six or seven years ago, but I smoked for a couple of years, which was stupid. Uh, not starting to work out much earlier and not reading more books in the way that I do nowadays. What's your, what's your favorite book recently? Ray Dalio principles. It's oh, just, that's, that's a tough read though. That's a, that's a long book. That is a long book, but it really, it was a game changer for me. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. I've, I've been, I've dived, I've div, dove into it. I'm American. I can't even speak English. Uh, <laughs> don't ask me. Don't ask the German. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've tried to get into it and it's really hard. It's just so much information and so long, but it is, it is a good book from what I've read. There's a really cool app out there that is free where you can just plug any keyword in or any problem that you have. And it will show you uh, paragraphs on the book that address this problem. I'm a huge fan. Okay, here, here's the most important question. It's also the toughest one. If I told you that I was, I had a big budget to make a movie about your life and you had to pick what genre it would be and the actor that would play you, who would you pick and, and what genre? Huh, wow. That is a million dollar question right there. <laughs> <sighs> the actor that I would pick, oh God. I'm trying to answer as quick as possible here. So genre would probably be a heist type of movie with a drama inflection point in the middle. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Um, and uh, the actor that would, oh my gosh, that's such a hard thing to do. Uh, such a hard choice to make. Jesus. I um, <laughs> I think something like a, um, probably going to change my answer, but uh, something like a, the first first one to come to mind is Mark Wahlberg. And that is specifically, yeah. <laughs> so don't that. get me wrong. I can see I, that. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not looking like Mark Wahlberg at all, but there's this crazy story where I was in Hollywood in a bar and there was a, was a, a woman from a PR agency coming over and she told me that I was looking like Mark Wahlberg. But I'm looking at this <laughs> as a complete joke because I'm not close to Mark Wahlberg at all. So. But that's my pick. I love it. I love it. <laughs> cool. I want to give you just a, a few minutes here. I want You can talk about what you're working on, what's important to you right now. Talk a little bit about G2 and then we can just wrap it up. Cool. Thank you so much, man. Um, what am I working on right now? So I really focus much more on G2 uh, since I started there, of course. Before that, I was doing a lot more consulting work in the startup world and different projects. And now I really had to regain my focus. And so at G2, I most recently worked on my vision and strategy, which is kind of an outlook in the next three to five years, what I think we should focus on and what, what I think we should do, which then turned into four objectives, which then turned into 17 different strategies that we're going to pursue. And I, I, I can't, you know, I can't talk about high level, but of course not to the, you know, sure. not to the lowest point. Otherwise I gave all my cards away here. But that's something that I recently worked on. And yeah, when I started, it was really just, you know, understanding how the business works, understanding what the most urgent versus important things are we have to address, raising a couple of smaller fires and putting the team together. So uh, I have four different teams, analytics, Offsite, SEO, and content marketing. We're about 35 people. Um, we've grown really quickly. And yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm in a position where I do so much less of the, the tactical in the weed stuff and so much more of the strategic uh, stuff, which is super exciting to me, which I really love, and which I also think doesn't get a lot of attention in the, in the content that's put out there. And I'm willing to change that. And are you, are you still working on side projects? Yeah, so I have my blog, which I, I pay, which, you know, I give a lot of love. I still send out my weekly newsletter, which has grown to 2,000 subscribers now, which I'm really proud of. It's not nothing against, you know, compared to other newsletters, but I've been doing this for a year and I, it's a real, real passion project yeah. of mine. And then I have a couple of other uh, smaller projects that are, that I've, yeah, that I just use to try some things out and, and they just kind of dabble along, but that I'm not really feeding that much at the moment. Awesome. Kevin, this is Kevin Indig, v VP Marketing for and Content for G2 Crowd. Thank you very much for coming on. It's a pleasure. Let's stay in touch. And uh, thank you for hopping on. Blake, this was awesome. You did a great job. And that's it for today's episode. Again, if you're a first-time listener or you've been at it since the beginning, please go ahead and rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. Wherever you get your podcasts, we've got you covered anywhere you want. 